Hey everyone, and welcome back, LRBS 2021. This is day two, and I'm really, really pleased to present Michael Holloway. Um, Michael is the president at Fifth Order Industry, and he will be discussing, this is a great title, Tribology for the Soul, how the science of tribology can help companies and people succeed. Um, usually there's Q&A afterwards, but unfortunately for all of us, Michael is not gonna be around for the Q&A and but i strongly suggest everybody who has questions afterwards or comments or wants to reach out to michael you can do so through the speaker profiles uh incredibly intelligent person and entirely charismatic and a uh, great curiosity he's wonderful and i know he would love to hear from everybody so let's get the presentation going and again there won't be a q a afterwards but we'll final up with everything and thank you very much Tribology for the soul, how the science of tribology can help companies and people succeed. Friction, wear, and lubrication is typically considered the stuff of machines. Drawing a comparison between a bearing or gear set to the human condition is ripe for consideration. Humans require analogies, comparisons, similes, a poetic content to make sense of their world. While a world built on logic seems utopian, it's not realistic, maybe never will be. We still use comparisons to understand and communicate, though. When examining a machine, the dynamics of a department, the working of a company, or even a relationship, they all experience failure, as well as a means to succeed. In the next minutes, we shall draw comparisons between the world of tribology and leadership, as well as the human interaction, with the objective to learn how to utilize tribology to make your company and your life run smoother. My name is Michael Holloway. Failure has several definitions. It can be any loss that interrupts the continuity of production. Maybe it's not meeting target expectations or something ceasing to function according to the original intent. Why failure occurs with anything can find root causes in methodology, materials, or even man. Often it's a combination of several factors, not just one reason. Failure is often considered bad, yet without an understanding of failure, methodologies will not be established or materials developed. Without understanding of failure and working to reduce or eliminate it, people would not grow to evolve. Most of failures are from wear. There are several wear out factors. With machines, bearings, gearboxes, pumps, and engines, etc., wear can be attributed to over 80% of failures that are experienced. Business is not much different than a machine, and it can be argued that there's no difference at all. The wearing out factors influence the structure and the veneer of the company comprising it due to one or more sources. This eventually leads to a lack of function and eventual abandonment of purpose. This can happen due to internal and or external reasons. Internal sources challenge the integrity of a company by providing stress factors within the company. The system does not provide direction, influence, the decay and eventual failure of the business. The business needs structure, needs methods, needs purpose, needs direction. Diminishing or lack of any of these will result in failure. The business may be out of balance or not built with the appropriate staff to work through the challenges. These sources are the result of unidentified vision, maybe a lack of support structure. In a machine, internal wear is typically attributed to friction created by two surfaces coming in contact with themselves or a third party without the separation barrier of a lubricant. External sources are factors that enter from the outside and affect the matrix of a company per se. Now, these sources are ever present, will always challenge the business unless a cohesive leadership direction is established, and methodology is managed. In your personal relationships, well, friction is generated by not enough lubrication, or maybe an outside source acts to establish a scenario that would interfere with your smooth operation of your relationships. External sources of machine wear might include dirt, water, heat even. Production materials are mismanaged. The wearing out result comes from either internal external sources, the cadence being random, cyclical, maybe a steady state, 
and the amplitude either be low or high, with intensity being a factor at the rate of decay. The same can be said for business and even your relationships. Something enters the process. It's not intended. Maybe it's another person, maybe another business, or even something abstract like a decision or a destructive idea or mindset. A common failure mode is from erosion. The machines could be as small grains of sand, dirt, dust, wear debris carried through the system and lubricating oil and blast away at the surface, the bearings or gears. In companies, erosion is the problem that constantly beats away at the personnel. Normally, this is found as small situations, but high in population. Erosion can take many forms. Constant reminders about not meeting budget or lack of sales, not hitting our various KPIs and not being met with our expectations. In some cases, erosion may be the from management decisions that leave the workforce feeling disenfranchised, maybe underappreciated. In our personal relationships, it's the constant nagging, the continuous stress brought about by our own short-sighted decisions, or may even be a situation that we have no control over but constantly wear at us. In a machine, abrasive particles are larger than the space between the moving surfaces, typically separated by the lubricant, though. Now, the tolerance of the moving parts has been engineered specifically for a given application. The space can be half a micron up to 150 microns, maybe. Abrasive particles exceed the space tolerances of the machine design, leading to, leading to a compromise in the metal surface. Now, as far as business is concerned, abrasiveness comes from leadership or subordinates. But either way, the abrasive nature affects the company by establishing an adversarial blame environment. Recipients become apologetic, defensive, pensive, apathy sets in. They acquiesce. Ideas are squashed, motivation diminished, productivity becoming drastically reduced, if not eliminated. In relationships, we've had situations with an abrasive partner or a friend, a family member, they may just slightly rub you the wrong way or be completely abusive. They grind at you. They wear you down. They finally expose a raw, bleeding, delicate spirit that's about to be crushed. In a machine, there's fatigue. You do it a hard particle that acts as a destructive bridge between two moving lubricated surfaces. That hard particle produces a stress fractures on the metal surface. It leads to surface deformation. When the surface becomes deformed, the physical integrity becomes compromised and the material break off, generating more wear debris, which leads to increased abrasiveness, erosiveness, and even fatigue wear later on. Yeah, fatigue in the business setting is a series of situations that occur that set up a wedge between departments and within departments. It stresses the structure. The initial situation is short-lived, but the long-term effects establish a chasm formation that can't be easily repaired. Often the debris from the department fracture is seen as an additional erosive factor that influence other groups, departments, divisions. In our relationships, well, fatigue sets up a destructive force by getting in between movement between each other only to crack the foundation that was previously established. After that thing created a fissure is gone, remain with a broken exterior only to manifest to such a deeper wound. It's difficult, not impossible to repair. There's galling. In a machine, galling is also known as cold welding or seizure. In a bearing, this can be seen when the bearing locks up, can no longer run. The oil or grease that was spreading out and separating out the rolling elements from the bearing are now melted due to the compromise of lubricant film. Perhaps the pressure was too great for the lubricant to remain, or the machine was ill-equipped, or the application exceeded the bearing's capability. Well, in business, when alliances form out of the pressures applied, but the result is not a cohesive attempt at a solution, rather a redistribution of fork focus with the intent of self-preservation. An adhesion between individuals or groups becomes an entity unto itself with its own motivation and purpose, which means often is not the best interest of the function of the business. In our relationships, external pressure can be great, so great that no amount of lubrication can help no matter how hard you try. This can be 
personal demons, maybe money issues, character flaws that emerge, a thwarting of wishes, unrealized dreams, unrealistic expectations. And then there's corrosion. Often water, acids, even caustics can corrode equipment unless the surface has been treated with a protective coating. Maybe the alloy's been structured in such a way that it reduces, if not eliminates, corrosion. And this can shield the metal from breaking down. In companies, corporate toxic elements normally would not have an influence now, take on a power to break down the surface and function of the business. Businesses need constant adjustments to the environment and must remain nimble to market changes and competitive threats. A business has to be made of an alloy that will resist corrosion, but if it's not, it has to be adjusted. And leadership must continuously steer while management process and change orders ensue. Without leadership or management, corrosion will set in. The corrosive factor is attributed to a weak alignment, weak management structure, maybe an absence of the methods and procedures that work best. In our personal relationships, unless your character has been developed to be able to weather a storm, your core may be corroded or may become corroded. We all get exposed to things that will change us in some form or fashion. Maybe not such a friendly manner either. These outside forces, these substances can break us down. A cavitation is due to pressure difference. It's a differential, but instead of positive pressure being applied, cavitation is a result of a vacuum, typically seen in business as a leadership vacuum. But we also see this cavitation wear in bearings and in pumps as well. It's an implosion. For a business, loses its direction and drive. It's a leadership vacuum. Communication has been distract, drastically reduced, if not non-existent. There's an implosion of force instead of an explosion. Often this will not be well understood. We all get a sense of what is occurring when there is an outward expression, an explosion yet. When things get driven inward, it's often unrecognizable until it's too late. With personal cavitation, it's not unlike equipment cavitation in that it's difficult to grasp, and even explain until you experience it. It truly is a form, the absence of something that creates, created it. The wearing out factors, they find their genesis in communication company condition, and leadership and management. Performance, we know what the root cause of failure is. Now we must understand how to reduce these causes. We're all victims of selective memory loss when it comes to failure. We can remember catastrophes when it comes to everyday experiences, and yet we forget many things. Reliability in terms of materials and machines, it's improved dramatically over the past several decades. An example would be automobiles. A few decades ago, an engine that would last maybe 100,000 miles without an overhaul was considered a gem. Today, engines can last five times that, considered typical. The same can be said for engine oil. Only 20 years ago, an oil change was recommended every 3,000 miles. Today, some vehicles can get 30, 40, 50, 70 to 100,000 miles between oil changes. Machine design coupled with material development has helped usher in the age of reliability. Yet failure still occurs. Why is that? Well, in business, there are countless sources why companies have failed. In personal relationships, well, personal failure is the mainstay of all therapies and religions. Everything fails for a reason. And the reasons can be broken down into categories such as material, machine, method, and man. Materials and machines have advanced dramatically over the past century, and the rate of improvement is almost exponential. Methods have been slower to progress. You know, with the advent of data management and application of statistics, reliability has increased with diminishes failure opportunities. Yet, when a system is analyzed and its reliability and entitlement is determined, one factor that is difficult to include is the human factor, man. Man is the one wild card variable that skews the projections and brings forth failure potential beyond the other three reasons combined. Now, after examining hundreds of failure analysis reports, it became glaringly apparent 
failure predominantly occurs because method failures, lack of competency. The reason for this is shared by the organization as well as the person who has not developed the required level of competency. This is a bold statement. It's an argumentative statement that might be challenged in public forum, yet always agreed upon behind closed doors. The challenge well, would be where, where to place blame. Is it the company who does not engage in the developing the correct level of competency? Is it the manager who does not recognize the need for establishing a basic level of competency? Or is it the employee who won't actively seek out training? Perhaps all three. By identifying the culprit, not change the fact that unless change is embraced and competency is developed, failure will continue. Now, Terry Wireman, the author, he stated that, eh, what was it? Ah, yeah, as the workforce ages out, the compromised educational system continues and a lack of technical apprenticeships, a perfect storm threatens the technical workforce. It's a great quote, Terry. When we look to apply such bold assumptions to our personal relationship failures, Rarely do we accept the fact that we basically were taught wrongly or how to interact despite or in our church over the grade school principal's office. We were made to feel guilty and shame, leaving us bitter and resentful. But were we given guidance to look to continuously make proper choices and adjustments to address the failure opportunities as they presented themselves on a continuous basis and learn from those failures? I've spoken on failure for many years now and always attempted to provide a method out. And this poem by T.S. Eliot is referencing the failure of a much grander institution. Nevertheless, the sentiment still resonates in a factory, in business, and in life. You cannot fake it. As T.S. wrote, they constantly try to escape from the darkness outside and within. By dreaming of systems so perfect, no one will need to be good, but the man that is will shadow the man that pretends to be. So how do we improve using tribology? Well, tribology, we all know, is a study of friction, wear, and lubrication. And if we consider friction, it's an application that produces that scenario. The scenario, well, produces the problem. That problem is wear predominantly, right? But that problem can be addressed with a solution. That solution is lubrication. Separating out those wear items in a manageable form. That's tribology. And this is things we can apply in not only our machines, our business, but also our life. In this case, let's explore the role of a lubricant in equipment life. That always looks to reduce friction and wear. What are those things that we can apply in business and in life and machines? Well, obviously machines, we can do oil and grease and what have you, surface treatment. We look to absorb and dampen shock. There's characteristics we can bring that into our, our personal lives as well. Being prepared, if you will. Well, I can do this in business as, as well, too, contingency plans. But obviously grease and oil dampen shock. We carry away heat, manage thermally. Sometimes we need a cooling off period in business as well as in life. Obviously, oil acts as a coolant. The lubricant has to keep the surface clean, spent particulate. Obviously, we can apply that kind of principle in our lives as well and in business and in the things we do. I suppose you could apply the 5S principles here. We know that lubricants, engine oils, our job is to keep the surfaces clean. Prevent rust and corrosion. This may be setting up to where the alloy has to be built in such a way, or maybe a material on the outside, an extra aid, something that will help us manage the corrosive nature of life, the corrosive nature that can occur within business, both external and internal, as well as, obviously, lubricants protect against corrosion and rust. We want to seal out dirt and contaminants. We want to keep these things at bay. Obviously, that's important with gears and bearings and engines and pumps and so forth. But it's important in business too. Keep the nastiness that doesn't belong outside of the relationships, outside of the business. It's got no place. Act as a flushing agent. If there is something in there that's detrimental to the success of the relationship or the business 
of the machine, flush it out. Get rid of it as soon as possible. And lubricant, ah, transfer of power. That's interesting as well. So it, it, it helps. It helps get the job done. Well, we can see where methodologies and principles can be applied like that in our own personal relationships as well as businesses. But obviously the same thing can be said for hydraulic fluids and gear oils and engine oils even. And sometimes have to act like a hydraulic fluid to transfer power. But finally, something that a lot of us never really consider, a lubricant, it's a conduit of information. We use this with oil analysis, condition monitoring. It tells us things. Well, same thing could be said for business and relationships as well. We have to take in information and utilize it appropriately, manage it, help us maintain. And how do we use these maintenance strategies? Well, we talk about reactive applications and preventive applications and predictive applications, reliability-centered maintenance hierarchy. Is what we're going to term this, right? And with reactive applications, we look at the small things, non-critical things, random to failure, things that are unlikely to fail per se, but maybe we have redundant systems. That's where we're going to, as they, as they get broken, as they start to fail, we're going to replace them. We're going to react to it. But obviously, we want to look at preventive. Look there. Things that are subject to wear over time, consumables, things for known predictable failure patterns associated with time, where the manufacturer Perhaps your mother recommends you to take care of and brushing your teeth twice a day, if not three times, and floss, right? Seven liters of water, seven hours of sleep, 100 push-ups, 30 pull-ups, reducing caloric intake by at least down to 2,000 calories. These are all things that are going to help prevent disease. We know these things for a fact. But our personal relationships, we also know this as well. The things that we can apply preventive-wise, these are the suggestions that our loved ones who had some insight wanted to provide us. Or maybe even our spiritual path. We know this in business as well, how we can prevent problems. But finally, look at the predictive applications, things that are measurable. Failure. Critical things. Semi-protected yet sensitive things. Things that will fail. Maybe induced by incorrect preventive maintenance things. Things that we could actually predict. If we applied a certain amount of methodology to measure and predict a potential failure opportunity, we do this by interpreting data, by taking a gauge of things from temperature, from vibration, from sound, from chemical analysis. It can help us predict. We can apply this in business and in life, but obviously in machinery. But what about proactive maintenance? One strategy we haven't mentioned. Now, mind you, there's 15, 18, 20 different types of maintenance strategies, depending upon who the author is, depending upon who the consultant, how much they want to sell on a billable hour rate. Everyone's got a different maintenance idea. But we just attacked the ones that we knew primarily the reactive, the preventive, the predictive, and obviously the proactive. And proactive, many of us agree. It, the basic tenet is don't let it fail the same way twice. We must learn, learn from things like failure cause analysis, failure mode effect analysis, where you actually try to understand why it occurred and then set up processes so it doesn't happen again. You want to use the data and experiences outside to help. That's all we have for this time. Heck, we could talk about this thing for the rest of our lives, but I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Feel free to give me a line, drop me a line anytime you want. You can access me on the company's website, Fifth Order Industry. If you want to go into lubricant.training, you can do that as well. Drop me an email, holloway at fifthorderindustry.com. Tell you what, give me a call, text me, go over to WhatsApp, 214-450-7864. I'd love to chat about this stuff. It's good stuff. It's fun. It's really good over a glass of whiskey and a cigar, but... But I tell you what, even if you don't drink whiskey or, or, or smoke a cigar, that's all well and good, too. I still love to talk about this. Stuff. It's fascinating. It's kind of fun. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the session. I'd love to hear from you. That was quite the presentation, Michael. Amazing. Thank you. Um, and again, uh,
if anybody wants to reach out, Michael uh, gave a lot of contact information, but also you can reach him on the speaker profile for any comments or questions, because unfortunately, as I said in the introduction, Michael is not available for any Q and A's right now, but definitely would, seems he would love to hear from everybody. Um, that was a great uh, presentation, lots of business lessons and life lessons. And uh, in about five minutes, I wanna give heads up reminders to everybody that uh, the next panel is coming up with uh, the title is Influences of AI and Machine Learning on the Future of Lubrication and Reliability. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the LRVS.